you know, it was funny. I was talking to a guy the other day, and uh, he was asking me, so what do you do? And I said, oh, not much. I said, I'm kind of pretty boring. And he says, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, to be honest, I said, you know, I like to talk about Jesus. I said, that's kind of what I enjoy. I said, you know, other people, I said, they can talk about like baseball and football and basketball and they got their favorite team and their favorite jersey and they have stats down and they have statistics and they have their fantasy team and they even have their... Other people have their American idols, you know, their favorite worship, you know, or their favorite secular musician. You know, I said, I really don't. You know, I said, I'm kind of boring. You know, I said, I really don't get into that kind of stuff. You know, it's like, yeah, I, I hear it and I go, well, you know, that's kind of nice. You know, it's like, oh, that's cute. You know, oh, that's interesting. You know, it's like, okay. Or like the Super Bowl, you know, if you ask me who won the Super Bowl, I don't remember. You know, I, I think I watched it. You know, but didn't pay that much attention. You know, it's kind of like, eh, you know, it's like it was a football game. You know, it's like <laughs> it's okay, and I don't remember who played it. I mean, I kind of don't belong, or if I do belong here, I'm the most boring Christian you're ever going to find. Because you see, I like to talk about Jesus. I get really excited about. Man, you start telling me about prophecy, and I'll say, yeah, let's let's get into it. Man, the spirit of prophecy is the spirit of Jesus, and the revelation of God was given to him so that he would know what the end times are all about because when he was here he didn't know so he said no man knows the day or the hour but as soon as he got to heaven he knew everything again because God told him God kept it to himself but then God revealed it to him when he got to heaven because it's called the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave unto him so that he'd be able to share it to his brethren really? well you know I mean I don't know that's kind of what I talk about <laughs> I love it because there's a friend on the internet that tells me, you know, every now and then gives a little kind of like, you know, encouragement because most people, they just don't realize that everyone needs encouragement. <laughs> Even me. Now, I pardon me, but I don't expect encouragement, so I don't really miss it if it's gone, you know, and kind of a little bit dumbfounded when I get it, but it's like, you know, this person encourages me by saying things like, uh, well, you really light up when you talk about Jesus. And I'm like, yeah, don't you? <laughs> you know, I just assume everybody you know, likes to talk about God. You know, and I begin to realize they really don't. You know, they want to talk about politics or they want to talk about religion or they want to talk about, you know, the latest hairstyle or, you know, any number of things that, man, I was a hippie. You know what? I got over that when I was 16 because I was such a hippie. I was into everything. You know, I studied this, studied that, read this, read that. You know, I was like an avid reader. So, boom, I filled my head full of what I call garbage, you know, because I was philosophical by the time I was 16. I was intellectual by the time I was 16. Man, I was into everything, you know. I mean, I could talk politics. I could talk philosophical. I could talk science fiction. I could talk science and development. I could talk research and development. I could talk about all kinds of worldly things, you know, and was really into it because, you know, frankly, my mind was inquisitive. I was fascinated by everything. History, oh, yeah, I'm a history buff. That's kind of why I can't really go there with some of the Christian, you know, versions of history, because I don't go with the secular versions either on some things. But you know, I can't quite balance out Christian propaganda about American history versus secular propaganda about American history when I studied history. I know better. <laughs> Everybody's trying to rewrite history. Why? I don't know. <laughs> but. You know, when I got saved, I kind of went, wow, all that junk that I know was kind of junk. And the more that I experienced life, the more I realized how worthless most of that junk was. As a matter of fact, for me, it was kind of like completely profitless. You know, sure, I could talk to anybody about any subject. You know, people were always kind of interested because I'd agree with them and I'd listen to them, you know, and I'd just go, yeah, you know, okay, I could add an intelligent quib or comment you know, every now and then for them to keep going on about their favorite subject because 
I don't know about you, but you're going to find that 90% of people don't really want to listen. They want to talk. They want to tell you about what they're going through. You know, I kind of like finding out what God is going through. You know, I always imagine, and I wrote a book about it, you know, and I like to write my science fiction series, or my, I call it my Christian fiction series, you know, a thousand years, about what it's like to live in the millennium, you know, walking with Jesus, talking with Him, spending time with Him, what an entire world will be like with a spiritual kingdom that's come to earth, you know, kingdom of heaven come to earth, you know, living here, existing with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all these other people that are going to be on earth at the same time as we are. I'm right about that. Funny how people aren't interested in that. You know, they always talk about going to heaven. I'm like, man, I still got a thousand years to put up with this world, you know? I still got to hang around here for another thousand years. But the nice thing about it is, I'm going to go check it out. I'm going to go verify some of these things. Like, go talk to Abraham. Of course, his frame of reference and my frame of reference are two different things, you know, because I'm coming from like a technology base, you know, and he's going to look at me like I'm stupid because. He's going to say, hey, you know what? I walked with God and talked with God. I don't know what you're talking about when it comes to computers. I haven't a clue what you're saying when it comes to, you know, this whole idea of, in, inter, what did you call it? Internet? What's texting again? I don't know what you're saying, you know, but I, I, do, I did talk to God, you know. And maybe we could relate on that level. So you see, I see a lot of my life in the world as kind of like meaningless. Because I kind of look at, like, what kind of reference points am I going to talk to Jesus about? Football? Baseball? Soccer? Uh, don't think so. But maybe you do. <laughs> so, okay. But I just like to tell people, you know, I'm really boring. You know. Do you want to come over to my house? Come on over. You know. You can see what I'm doing. What I'm doing is what I'm doing. <laughs> Recording, reading, studying, applying, you know, <laughs> promoting, sharing, caring, daring to pray, to ask, to seek, to find Jesus in every circumstance of my life, to walk with him, to talk with him, to tell other people that, you know, as surely as the wind blows, Michael goes, you know, and when the wind blows with her will, so too is everyone led by the Spirit of God. So too, God has always done that in my life. So I look at the wind a little differently than some people. Where do you want me to go today, Lord? <laughs> so I kind of treat my life as living in, with, and by the Son of God. Because I personally have an intervention with God. You know what I mean? That's what I call my devotionals. You know, they're kind of like an intervention. I know, maybe you don't, but God is real. So God really speaks to me and I really do go take baths, which I'm about to do and get all cleaned up and shaved up again, you know. And I hate shaving, so I'm going to get all cleaned up and shaved completely off so that I can let it grow for a while and not have to shave. You know, I'm going to kind of like soak in a hot tub, you know, which is really my bathtub because I don't have a hot tub. I'm not like one of those Christians that get to have a hot tub now and maybe not one in heaven. <laughs> well, you know, I go to hot springs, you know. When I want a hot tub, I go far away, like Oregon or someplace out in the middle of nowhere to find some hot springs, and then I go in the hot springs, you know, and I say, thank you, God, for giving me a hot tub. It's just me and you, God. Sometimes I take my wife. <laughs> me, you, and my wife, God. We're joyous to enjoy in the hot springs, the ones you provided, not the ones we made. Because, you see, everything that God made, man is making into his own image. That's what we call technology. Look around you. When you get all the way to the end of your, really, understanding, then you're going to come up with this whole thing about what God was able to do naturally, man is trying to do unnaturally. And I'm not saying that I'm a naturalist or a greenie, but hey, you know, I, God seems to have done a better job with what he had to work with than what we're doing with what we have to work with, because I don't know about you, but all the technology I've seen so far, if you see what it costs, like, how do you make these things and what did it cost to actually come up with this? I don't know that I want to pay that kind of price. You know, kind of like, there's carcinogens, there's this stuff that, you know, causes cancer. We never really research things to find out what it really costs. You know, it's kind of like 
we got styrofoam for the longest time, you know, and it was like, hey, styrofoam cups, this is really cool, man. You know, we got a styrofoam cup, man. This thing, this thing is great. You know, it can hold hot fluids, it can hold cold fluids, and it keeps them cold. And then they just told us that that styrofoam that we've been drinking causes cancer. And I went, really? Not too smart an invention. Man, whatever happened to coconut shell? If I carve that out, you know what? I can make a nice little bowl. could serve as a kind of a drinking tool, too. You know, I could use a gourd, too, you know. I could I could actually use clay from the ground, you know, in a pot and kind of burn it, you know. And I don't have to paint it. I could just burn it, you know, and be perfectly safe, wouldn't it? Ooh, forgive me. <laughs> I don't want to interrupt the technology here. I like computers. I'm doing them right now. But the point is, I'm boring because what I use all these things for is to go to God in a better way and to present God in the best way that I know how. Sharing Him from the reality of what I see Him every day and the time that I spend with Him. So, I hope you don't get the wrong impression about me, but you know, I really am boring. My wife puts up with me because she knows that, you know, if you want to talk to Michael, what he really wants to talk about is Jesus. And, you know, her kids aren't saved, so, you know, like, they know that, you know, if they want to talk to me, I'm probably going to be talking about what's going on with my life. And um, what's going on with my life is Jesus. <laughs> I might listen for, oh, I don't know, about five minutes. You know, and then I'm kind of like, okay, well, you know, people go through the same cycle over and over and over again. I'm kind of. Principles of Life is a video series I'm doing on the repetitions of life, you know, and how people go through these same cycles. They carry this baggage around all over, wherever they go, because they don't take literally the Word of God as our instruction guide for life and um, apply it to their life so they don't know why. Sometimes they'll sit down and say, you know, I don't know why this keeps happening to me, and I'm like, Hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. I know why, but you don't want to know. <laughs> and I tell people that all the time. I go, even on the internet when I'm writing sometimes, somebody will ask me a, a pointed question, a direct question, and I answer them politely as best I can to start with by saying, do you really want to know? Because you see, Jesus had some direct questions asked him, and he said, wisdom is justified over children. And he wasn't using that as a positive statement. It was a slam against those that thought they were wise in their own eyes for asking certain questions. And he said, look, wisdom is justified over children. And what that means is that you prove your wisdom by your actions of what you do with the knowledge you've been given. So wisdom would be manifested by the action of knowledge or if you want to put the opposite there also, because it's also true. Foolishness is proven by action, not by words. They may say something, but until their actions do that, they don't fall into the pit. They just simply create the pit. Once their actions follow their words, then they fall into the pit. Because literally, usually, your actions will follow your words. Is that once you've said something, you're usually going to fall into it pretty soon. May not be right away. May take time, but God brings it to you because we reap what we sow. So, knowing all this and applying Proverbs and Psalms and all this to my life and like seeing, wow, God, this is cool. I like the way that you make the scriptures fit to my life and how everything seems to have a purpose and everything's designed perfectly for me to enjoy and to participate in and to use in the kingdom of God and to see the kingdom of God all about me and within me and all around me and everything that I see and then beyond that see even more that I can't see, that other people can't see, unless you show it to them, and then I get to see it, and sometimes when you and I, we just walk away and go do something special. Yeah, I'm kind of boring that way. But I've taken a few people along the way, too. You know, They got bored, sort of, with me. Because they had a direct confrontation with God, and they went, I'm not ready for this. Boom, and head the other way. Because, you see, I used to do this, and you're not going to like this. Some of you pastors or some of you elders or deacons or people that are so smart that, you know, you were smarter than I was because I was kind of dumb when I was younger and evangelism. I would get frustrated at times with people, you know, 
I'm sure you have. You know, you get frustrated at times with people. And I'd say, you know what? To a friend, you know, somebody that I knew and I, I've been spending time with, you know, we've talked about God and different things, you know. So I would come up to them and say, because their life was, you know, just a shambles and a pit and a mess, you know, and I'd finally have to confront them directly, you know, like people say, well, you know, we don't want that. We should watch the gospel. You know, well, if you aren't willing to live with the person and die with the person, don't give me that confrontational Christianity stuff because unless you're willing to put up with that person, love them through their time of trial and tribulation, don't even give me confrontational because unless you're willing to take them into your home, pardon the expression, used to be called bite me. <laughs> Jesus lived with his disciples, period. Hello? Dealt with them. Everything. Peter? Phew! Downwind. Please. <laughs> you know, whatever. Fisherman, you know. <laughs> downwind, Peter. <laughs> Man, we need to work on hygiene. But the point is, is that when I got frustrated with different people that God had put into my life specifically to witness to and to share with and to care with, I would spend sometimes months, years, you know, quite a bit of time with them. And at some point in time, confront them. And I'd say, look, I've had it. You don't think God speaks? You don't think God's real? Here, here's a Bible. I'm willing to risk my faith and look like a complete idiot and fool just so that you can know that God is real and that Jesus will speak to you today. Because today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. And I'm telling you that I am willing to risk flipping this sucker open, let God speak to you, whatever it is. I want you to take this Bible, sit down, say a prayer, whatever, just open it up to the, anywhere you want to and see if God doesn't speak to you. Because I'm telling you right now, right this moment, in this time, in this place, God is going to speak to you. And I don't care what you think. I don't care what you believe. I don't care what your faith is. I don't care where you came from. I don't care where you're going. You will know that God has spoken to you. Now, from that moment on, I don't know what you're going to do, but I'm telling you, whatever it is, the most important thing in your life, think about right now. Write it down if you want to, but think about it, because this is between you and God and it has nothing to do with me. It is to reveal whether or not God can speak to you. And I tell them this, you know, I get real mad. And they knew I was serious, because when I get mad, I'm serious. So they knew it. You know, they're like, what got into Michael? He's always so loving. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> That's some rough edges. You know, they've been working on and still working on my rough edges, like shaving. Anyways, so I'd confront them. And uh, needless to say, you know, I would be thinking, God, I don't want to do this. I, because this is before it happened. I'm going, God, I don't want to do this. If you're telling me to do this, I'm not going to do this. I don't want to do this. Because, you know, if you do this and God hasn't told you to do it, you're going to be a fool because it ain't going to happen, right? But because God was using me in a certain way at a certain time for a certain person, guess what? They'd go, flip it open. Now, I don't know if this is going to work. <laughs> and it would be, he that passes by and meddleth with strife belongeth not to him is like one that taketh the dog by the ears. As a madman who casts firebrands, arrows, and death, so is the man that deceives his neighbor and says, Am not I in sport? I was just kidding. <laughs> where no wood is, there the fire goes out. So where there is no tail bearer, the strife ceaseth. Anyways, so I flip it open, you know, and I mean, they would, you know, have some major concern. Like one time, one of them I can remember, you know, a gal and a guy were getting ready to get married, you know, and he was telling me that he had doubts about getting married, and I said, well, you know, I said, I can't tell you what to do. You know, I said, I'm a Christian. I said, I'm a born-again Christian. I personally think that marriage should be sat down and thought about seriously, because once you get married, you stay married. I'd gone through a divorce, so, you know, saying that doesn't make much sense, but I said, you know, it's something I believe in. It doesn't mean that I don't understand divorce, because I do understand it. You know, I said, you know my ex-wife, you know, and believe me, people did, because she kind of went, like, off the deep end. But, anyways, having said that, you know, God bless her, wherever she is, I hope that she's, you know, gotten her life back together, and, you know, I still pray for her. But the point being is that, when I shared with them, I said, you know, marriage is a serious subject, you know, I said, you should treat it as though it were you, your wife, and God, because that's really what it is, it's three people involved in this marriage, you know, I said, 
we all witness it and you know testify to it but it really boils down to you and God and then she and God and then you and she and God you know there's three different circles of involvement there and you know the woman was pregnant you know and so he was kind of like marrying her for the baby's sake you know and I was kind of like okay you know so I said if you don't know Jesus I said you should probably get to know Jesus first you know I said that's the most important thing it's more important than marriage it's more important than anything else in your life I said God is real so you know we went through the whole thing like I told you and I kind of had been you know counseling them for a long time you know and finally said look you know you need to make Jesus real in your life if you want to know if Jesus is real or not take a Bible walk in the other room whatever's the most important thing in your life is you know think about it and then flip it open the scary thing was was that he did the scary thing was was that God spoke to him the scary thing is is that he followed through with it and no offense to him but or to you know their plans they decided not to marry because what happened was that he flipped open to a scripture that talked about reconciling yourself to your parents and getting your parents permission and seeking to somehow you know whatever about with parents now I don't remember the exact psalm at the time but apparently it was a psalm or someplace in scripture and I said look I can't tell you what to do because he came back and he was all excited he had his eyes were lit up his face was excited he was going I, I know God speaks God spoke to me and I know what I have to do I know what I'm supposed to do today and I was like uh oh because every time in the past whenever I did it they all said that but then the next day they always changed their mind so I was kind of like thinking great Lord now you're going to make me you know right but then the next day look me, make me look like an idiot so anyways in this case the guy chose to follow what God told him to. He went back uh, to his parents. He sat down and reconciled himself with his parents and told them that, you know, he was sorry for running away. He had been a runaway, I guess, you know, and he reconciled himself to them, you know, and said that, you know, he wanted to, you know, work on their relationship together, you know, him and his mother and his father and that, you know, they had some issues, you know, they were working on and that he was now becoming a Christian, you know, a born-again Christian like they had always wanted him to be, you know, and, that he had sat down, you know, with this guy, you know, and the guy said, you know, look, you need a Bible, first of all, so I'll give you my Bible, and I gave him my Bible, you know, and uh, you need to, you know, and he flipped it open, and he told him the whole story, you know, and I was like, wow, that's kind of cool, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, like, this is kind of goosebumps, even now I think about it, and so he had done that, unfortunately, the cost that it was, was that his person he was going to marry was my best friend's daughter at the time, and uh, um, she was ticked because she wasn't a Christian and so she got pissed off that he was willing to go back and reconcile and talk to his parents about it because he knew she knew they were Christians and so she called off the marriage wound up not getting married they she wound up splitting and going back east someplace and running away from her my best friend you know and my best friend then went ahead and he was a Christian and he's still a Christian you know he's kind of <laughs> he's, he's an interesting Christian. He's kind of what we used to call a fringe Christian. You know, you know. Well, anyways, he disowned me for a long time, you know, and then finally, you know, when he needed something, came back to me. You know. But anyways, that's another story. But the praise of the Lord, you know, there was a cost to sharing Jesus in a personal way, in a real way, demonstrating and letting God do what he wanted to do his way. Now, I'm not telling you to flip open your Bible because, you know, there's a whole theology about Bible flippers, you know, the people that have abused it and they confuse it and they make it into something that's not or something that's real or something, whatever. I'm not saying that's a theology. I'm not saying that's a, a application of what you should be doing. I'm just saying in that moment, at that time in my life, with those certain people, I think it only happened maybe eight times in my life, that God used that when it was like the end of the rope, so to speak, you know, and something dramatic always happened. <laughs> And I have no forgetting those because they were always dramatic. <laughs> Man, it got to where I was like, Lord, I don't want to do this. I don't want it. I know God. I am not going to do this. <laughs> I was arguing with God before I would do it. So, you know, I was more like the Jonah routine than, <laughs> than the David routine or the Abraham routine. It wasn't my faith. And <laughs> believe me, I was like, uh uh, I ain't doing this. So, whenever I was mad, I wasn't mad at the person. I was mad at God because he's making me do it. So, long story short is that having said that I enjoyed those intervention times that God 
revealed himself in people's, other people's lives, so much so that in my latter days, meaning now, I love the fact that people are connecting with the reality of a living God who can do what he wants to do with you any time he wants to, the way he chooses to. And yes, you should study your scriptures, you know, you should be reading your Bible, you know, consistently going through Genesis through Revelation, line upon line, precept upon precept, learning what the Bible is, learning how to read it, learning that it's spiritually understood and, you know, having baptized with the Holy Spirit or spiritual, you know, awakening and awareness come inside you that God is speaking through you, in you, by His own Spirit so that you become born again, not of the flesh, but of the Spirit, and that God is the one who is actually doing it and not you just confusing it. You see what I'm saying? So, there's a whole balance there. You know, you got to keep a kind of balance, you know, because sometimes when we go through life, we do this, you know, you know, roller coaster ride and our emotions take over and then our stupidity takes over and our actions take over and once you get through it all, you know, if you did it the hard way, then maybe if your life was like mine, you get a chance to share with people all the wrong ways to do it. <laughs> I'm not so sure that I did the wrong ways. I'm just saying God led me the ways that I went. Even though my one of my sisters likes to say, "Ain't no way, Jack." <laughs> and I'm like, "Well, on that occasion, yeah. You know, it's kind of like you know, Lord was with me, and Lord told me. And I was like, you may not understand it, and I didn't, but you know, it's the way it went. So." All I can share with you is that having a personal relationship with God, when I say it, I mean it. I'm, I don't spend anything else, you know, of my days. They are spent Monday through Friday consistently all day long talking to God, walking with God, sharing with God, sometimes screwing up, you know, in my own little, you know, sinful way and then kind of like, oh, Lord, I'm sorry, you know, man, God, would you please help me with this? You know, little things, but... You know, nothing real major, you know, that we got to go, oh my God, you know, you are so disgusting, you know, you need to straighten that out. But rather, you know, God, I am so disgusting, you need to straighten that out. <laughs> so, my point being is that we need to be real. You know, I don't want all the clutter in my hat or my head, either one. I don't want to listen to you when you're telling me all about politics. I don't really want to hear about, you know, the latest football game and, you know, a new T-Bow effect, you know, because who cares? John 3.16, at the end of the football game, when we used to see it, you know, when they used to have the little billboards, to me was bigger deal than, you know, some guy praying on the sidelines. Praise the Lord, you know, I admire, you know, all the Christian quarterbacks that are in the NFL nowadays, and there's more than just Tim Tebow. You know, and I admire the fact that people want to, you know, kind of like emulate or follow after, but he's got his own personal relationship with Jesus, just like you do, you know. So you be you, I'll be me, you know. And for me, I'm boring because I don't want to be a Christian football player. I want to be a Christian. See, I'm just me. I'm someone who walks with and talks with Jesus and likes it. <laughs> So I call myself the most boring Christian in the world, and I kind of share devotionals that way. So I always look and find all my different devotionals that fit who I am. And, you know, there's seven of them, you know, that are all kind of as different as night and day. And I share them, you know, and I use them now in the video ministry. Surprises. Many there are who think that I test and train and bend to my will. I, who bade the disciples to take up the cross, I love to prepare a feast for them. By the lakeside, a little glad surprise, not a necessity as the feeding of the multitude may have seemed. I love to give the wine gift at the marriage feast. As you love to plan surprises for those who understand and joy in them, so it is with me. I love to surprise you. I love to plan them for those who see my love and tender joy in them. I am as personal and as real as you are willing to allow me to be by observing who I am and knowing me. Dear to the heart of my Father are those who see not only my tears and the tears of a Savior, but the smile and the joyful realization of a friend who is walking with you all the days of your life. <laughs> you know, I can't help but think, man, can you go to God like that? Can you have a Savior, a Jesus, 
really want to spend time with the world? I keep thinking of that song, this is not where I belong. You know, I mean, it is because God wants me here right now, but I'm going home, you know, to be with somebody that I'm looking forward to seeing again. Because personally, I think I know what he looks like. And I think I spent some time with him quite a bit. And I, I think I, I know what his voice sounds like. And pretty confident I know how he's going to react to me, you know. And pretty sure that, you know, I know how he's going to react to you. And some of you might not be so good. <laughs> some of you might be great. But you can kind of tell that already just by where you're at today. Because who you talk about, really, what you're doing today, what your plans are today, reveal a lot about what your relationship with Jesus is like. You know? So, I kind of hope that it's really like way over the top, kind of like what they say, you know, on fire. You know, kind of like hot. Because I'd hate to think that it was cold or that you really don't know Jesus at all. Because maybe it's time to shake out all that stuff that you kind of like added to your life and get back to Jesus in the first place. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Kind of that return to your first love thing. Or maybe you haven't learned to love Jesus in the first place. I don't know. The way you tell an idol is by what you spend the most time with. So, do you have an idol in your life? Or do you have Jesus?